Okay, um, now it's 1.35 and uh, let's get started. We didn't finish the last class, so let's wrap up what we, uh, what we supposed to, uh, to, to wrap up. Um, at the end of the last class, we discussed the depth of field. That's how deep you can make your image in focus. There's one note, um, SEM has way better depth of field than optical microscope. I'll just write that down. In a few minutes, when I show some PPT, you'll see the, uh, the difference. The same feature when you take a picture using optical microscope and when you take a picture using SEM. Let me ask you, um, why SEM, in most of the cases, if not all cases, SEM has way better depth of focus, depth of field than optical microscope? Any guesses? Think about very, what we very wide in comparison. Can you say that again? Is the lens technically very wide in comparison? So, sorry, I couldn't hear you very clearly. C can you speak like slower? Is the uh, the lens for the electron microscope in comparison to a normal optical microscope technically much larger? Uh, in terms of the lens, it's about the same. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the figures I drew on top, like what happens when we have a small depth of field? What happens when we have a large depth of field? Then think about uh, if you, or when you use optical microscope, uh, what happens between the sample and the objective lens? The objective lens in optical microscope is the ones like you, you can rotate, you can switch around. In terms of the lens, um, in principle, electro, uh, electromagnetic lens and optical lens, they are similar, but there's one dramatic difference between the optical microscope setting and SEM setting. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll see whether I can turn the other camera on and show you the optical microscope. So this is the optical microscope and these pieces are objective lenses. When you look at the sample using, op uh, using the, uh, the optical objective lenses, what happens? Let me go back to uh, the sample in optical microscope. It's always very close to the objective lens. You have a short working distance. That's why the depth of field is not good. But in SEM, if you recall what we used last week, we can use up to 80 millimeters from the, uh, the, the, the objective lens. So in SEM, you can achieve a way better, a way larger working distance. That's why this is one of the main reasons you have way better depth of field than optical microscope. Does this make sense? Yes? Okay, let's move on to the very last part of the instrument, scanning coils. For scanning coils, they are made from electrostatic plates. If we draw um, the scanning coils, we can draw them in this, uh, in this way. And underneath that, we have the objective lens. We call OL. We have the beam coming down. Let's just use the, uh, the green line to show the beam 
as well as the optical axis. So this is the optical axis. When the beam travels straight there, the meets the, uh, the first set of the electrostatic plates, it will bend. And when it meets the, uh, the second set of the electrostatic plates, it will bend again. Then that enables the scanning of the beam, the, ra the, the rastering of the beam. And if we do that symmetrically, and if this is the specimen surface, this would be the image length or the image width. The role of scanning coils is to control the magnification. why it controls the magnification. Let's do a simple thought experiment. What if, what if we weaken the, uh, the strength of the scanning coil? If we weaken the strength of the scanning coil, let's use a different color using magenta, the beam will bend less, and it will bend less again. What we ended up having, let's just draw that symmetrically again. is a new image width. This is the new image width. From the schematic, you can see when you weaken the strength of the scanning coil, we'll look at a smaller area. If we look at a smaller area, are we increasing the magnification or are we decreasing the magnification? Any answers? Any guesses? So the magenta image length or image width is smaller than the green one. So we're looking at a smaller area. So by doing that, are we increasing the mag or are we decreasing the mag? Any guesses? Daniel answered in the chat. He says increase. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I cannot see the uh, the, uh, the response from the, uh, the, the the chat box. Uh, you're exactly right. So by weakening the strength of the scanning coil, you're looking at a smaller area. If you're looking at a smaller area, you're looking at a large magnification. So increase the mag. Um, if you have the answer, please do not be afraid. Please speak up. That's excellent. So if you strengthen the uh, scanning coil by increasing the voltage, then you're looking at a larger area. By looking at a larger area, you are, you are using a small mag. You are decreasing the mag. Does this make sense? OK. Let's recap what we learned in terms of the, uh, the instrumentation. Let's do a recap. So we started by drawing the instrument. 
on the very top, we have the electron source. That was what we covered two classes ago. Then uh, after that, we have the condenser lens. Then after that, we have the scanning coils. And after that, we have the objective lens. Let's look at the function one by one. For the condenser lens, the row of condenser lens, as the name suggests, is to condense electron beam or to converge electron beam. Then the Scanning coils controls the magnification. When you use SEM, you increase the Mach, you decrease the Mach. What you are doing is actually to change the strength of the scanning coil or change the voltage applied on the scanning coils. Then the row of, of, uh, of the objective lens is to, to do focus. When you see the image out of focus, when you see the image like blurry, you tune the other focus. When you turn the other knob, what you are doing is actually to change the strength of the objective lens to bring the image into focus. So these are the functions of those three things. For the scanning coils, I want to say one more thing. Maybe you guys are too young to know the old TV sets. Um, nowadays, in your living room, in your bedroom, you have the flat screen. You have the flat TV screen. But uh, when I was a kid, the TV actually has three dimensions. It's not like two dimension screen. Uh, it's more like a box. At the end of the box, or at, at, at the back of the box, you have a cathode ray gun. The TV images were created by scanning electrons hitting the screen then you can see what's going on on the screen. The principle of scanning the cathode ray at the back of the TV sets, the old TV sets, is the same as the SEM. To me, it's a fun fact, but um, maybe for you guys, uh, you guys are more into plasma sc uh, screen or the, uh, the OLED screens, but the first, gen uh, I wouldn't say the first generation for many many years the tv sets they run the same they run the uh, the same principle as what we uh, as the ones we use in sem in addition to the uh, um, the hardware part we also discussed two things we discussed the effect of condenser lens strength on the, uh, the emissions you can achieve, as well as the effect of working distance. One takeaway message I hope you get from the end of this lecture is that it's always compromised. When you gain something in electron microscopy, you lose something at the same time time, then it becomes important what you're looking for. If you're looking for good resolution, one um, strategy is to reduce the, uh, the working distance. If you are looking for um, a large depth of field, then one strategy is to increase the, uh, the working distance. So you have not just focus to play with. There are a lot more you can do using SEM. Any questions before we go to the, uh, the PowerPoint slides? Any questions? Uh, I have a quick question. So what is the uh, voltage uh, applied to uh, scanning coils? 
Mm, because it's a electrostatic, uh, th those are electrostatic plates. So by uh, alternating the, the, the voltage, then you change the, uh, the, 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 like how much bending you do to the, uh, to the, to the beam. Uh, if you do, for example, from one to zero, um, it, it, will, it will bend the beam not as much, but if you do uh, 10 to zero, it will bend the beam much more. Does this answer your question? Um, the voltage is actually changing. It's like, a, it, it follows like a sine wave that allows you to do, this, to do the, uh, the scanning. But um, large mag magnification versus a small magnification is the maximum value you set in the um, sinusoidal wave. Okay. Does, okay. It, so I guess it's clear. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Cool. So let's go to the other slides. Uh, let's go back to the uh, the, the uh, photograph of the electromagnetic lens in the class. We've been using uh, we've we've been drawing the schematics. And on the left, it shows a real photograph of a real electromagnetic lens you use in both SEM and TEMs. Um, around this lens, you have wires wrapping around, going around. In the second figure, it shows the cross-section. Um, down here, you see a slit. This creates something we call a fringe magnetic field, which pushes the electron and making electrons to, to do what we ask them to do. In the class, we also discussed the, the depth of the field. Uh, on the left, it shows, a, uh, shows an optical micrograph of a diatom from the, from the ocean. And on the right, it shows the same thing, but using SEM. On the left, you can see only small parts, only small parts are in focus when you are leaving the, uh, the, the focal point, everything becomes out of focus very quickly. But on the right, you can see everything, all the features are in focus. That's why SEM, SEM has way better depth of field than optical microscope. If you want to see something in 3D, SEM is a way better technique compared to optical microscope. Regular, uh, regular optical microscope. Um, if you pay attention, it says SEM, then secondary electrons. Um, this image is, for, uh, is formed using secondary electrons. That's what we are going to discuss in details in the next class, in the later class today. What else we have? More uh, uh, pictures on the depth of focus. On iPhone 10, which came out a few years ago, they have the portrait mode. Um, the one, the, the, the image on the left shows a very small depth of field. So you can see the strawberry in focus, but the background is very blurry, gives you like a dreamy and uh, very nice impression. The image on the right shows everything in focus uh, or everything largely in focus. The, the strawberry is, is in focus, but the swing in the back, in the background, as well as the trees, they're only slightly out of focus, but not really blurred away. Um, to me, I'm just speculating in iPhone, I don't think they really changed the optics. I think this is achieved through image processing. This is my speculation. Uh, I, I didn't look into that. By playing with the, uh, the depth of field, you can also generate really impressive images. So this is another image. You can see this, this part is in focus. Above and below, both are out of focus. Looks very nice. Then this is a photo of Texas, uh, capital Austin. So this is the, the state capital. Again, the middle part of the image is in focus. Above and under, it goes out of focus very quickly. It gives you a very nice sensation. Um, I think it's either Milan or another city in Italy. So it looks very nice. Okay, if no questions, let's move to a new module of the course. We talked about the first part or the first module of the course is on instrumentation. The second part is on electron material interaction. And in this part, you'll learn why we can see certain images 
from SEM. Today, we're going to talk about the, uh, the first part. Um, the first mode you can use in SEM is called secondary electrons. In fact, most of SEM images you see, those are secondary electron images. So let's just write that down. So secondary electrons. Let's look at why it is called secondary electrons first. Let's start by drawing the uh, atomic model. Assuming this is the, uh, the nucleus of an atom, then we have electron orbitals going around. Or just draw three for the sake of simplicity. Okay. And we have electrons moving around. Okay. Then in SEM, we have high energy electron beam from the source, or use a different color. So we have electrons, use the green dot, from the source. And this electron travels down and interacts with the, uh, the material. This high energy electron can interact with the electrons inside the material and uh, kick out, let me use a different color, and kick out this electron. After the collision, this electron will keep traveling down like that. The electron getting ejected is called secondary electron. In abbreviation, it is called SE. Since this is the secondary electron, which one is the primary electron? Any guesses? Uh, the one that, that's not interacted. Uh, you're getting close to the right answer. Um, um, it's on the screen. It's on the screen. Any guesses? So the electron from the source, from the electron gun, is the primary electron. So this one is the primary electron. Primary electron is very useful. When we discuss the second type of images we can form, uh, the bad scattered electrons, those are formed from the primary electrons. But in most of the cases, we use the secondary electrons to form the other image. The electron is getting ejected from the material. Um, let's have a closer look at the uh, primary electrons. Um, when it hits the, uh, um, the electron inside the material and ejects the, the, the electron, a uh, secondary electron, um, will the green, like the, the green electron, the primary electron lose energy or not? Any guesses? So let me say energy loss, the question mark. Energy. Yes, no? You must lose energy, right? There's collision. Exactly. Uh, 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 your answer's right, but collision not necessarily mean, uh, it's, it does not necessarily mean it will be, uh, it will be losing energy because in uh, undergrad physics, when we talk about the uh, collision, it can be elastic and inelastic. When you have two spheres colliding, together, uh, the, the elastic collision is that there's no loss in energy. In inelastic collision, there's loss of energy. But your answer's right, there's energy loss. To be more specific, there's a small amount of energy loss, small amount. So, 
So um, in physics, we call this process inelastic scattering. By the way, it was very good. Like you, uh, uh, you guys got the right answer. Okay. The uh, the secondary electrons, on the other hand, let's look at the uh, the energy again. Um, the primary electron energy is very high, so this one has high energy. The energy of the primary electron is determined by the voltage you use in the electron source. If I use a 20 keV beam, then the electron energy is 20 keV. The, ele the secondary electrons, the secondary electrons, the energy is much lower. And that determines one important feature we see in the SE images. When we use SE to form images, usually we are only getting the surface information. What happens? to the secondary electrons generated deep down in the specimen. The secondary electrons generated deep down in the specimen cannot reach the surface. So let's, let's just write that down. Generated. The secondary electrons generated deep down in the specimen cannot reach the other surface. Thus, they cannot escape from the surface. If they cannot escape from the surface, then they cannot be captured. If you are interested in the surface information, the secondary electron is the way to go. Does this make sense? If you have something buried 30 microns down, you cannot use SE mode to reveal the information. Even, when, even if there are electrons generated from deep down, on the way out, they will lose energy and they will be absorbed by the material again. The second thing we want to look at is the um, the kind of like the schematic of how the detector looks like. Or how detector works. How I see detector works. Let's, let's just draw a schematic. We have the specimen here. We have the incident electron beam hitting the specimen surface. Um, one thing you need to know from now on, from this chapter on, is when we have electrons hitting the specimen, it's not only here giving you the information. There is an interaction volume Usually it's like a tear chopped shape and information from this volume can escape and provide the information. When we have the primary electron beam hitting the uh, 
the specimen, let's actually use a different color for the secondary electrons because it's not primary electron anymore. Which color did we use? Red color. Okay, so let's just use red. It will generate secondary electrons. This is primary electron. When the secondary electrons are generated, they go in all random directions. Then how can we capture that information? Then what you need is to insert a detector. A straw detector. We have done that previously in the SEM schematic. What happens to the detector is in the very front, you actually have a metal mesh kind of like a mic, we go to, uh, uh, go to sing karaoke. Then on this metal mesh, you actually apply a small voltage, we call voltage grid, and it's positively charged. What this does is it will attract the SE, the secondary electrons to the detector. So you will try to capture as many secondary electrons from that pixel as possible by applying a small bias. And inside the detector, you have optical fibers. So let's just say optical fiber. The electron the signal will be converted into photon. The signal then is captured by the detector and registered to the computer. There's a name for this detector. Uh, if you go to um, SEM training or if you go to any microscopy um, conferences, people will refer this as Everhart Sony detector. So it's called Everhart. Sony That's why it's also called ET detector. If you go to conferences or um, um, the uh, expos, people refer to Everhart Sony detector. That's a secondary electron detector specifically, specifically. That's how the detector captures information on each pixel. In SEM, of course, you will move your beam, you, you raster the beam. So it will, it will move the primary beam from the first position, maybe to the new position. And it will generate the uh, interaction volume. And again, secondary electrons will be generated and captured. That's how you create the pixel by pixel information in SEM when you capture the secondary electron image. Does this make sense? Okay, I didn't see any questions. I didn't hear any questions. Let's address the third question. How we can see contrast? How do we get the surface information using secondary electrons? and secondary electron detector. So how we see surface features. Using SE. The surface feature can be also called tomographic feature. Let's assume you have a bump in your, uh, on your specimen surface. Okay, let me move that down slightly so we have room to draw the uh, detector. Let's still use green color for the primary electron beam. Let's look at uh, the, uh, the setting. Assume we have the detector 
on the on the right on the right top corner. So detector. is here. We have the, uh, the electron beam hitting on the back side of the bump. This is the primary beam. Then it will generate secondary electrons. However, there is a small bias on the detector. So the secondary electrons generated try to initially it runs in all different directions, but it tries to go to that detector. But some of the electrons can get blocked by the feature itself. So in this pixel, it will appear dark. So here's less signals. captured. In this pixel, it will appear to be dark. Now, the electron beam moves to that side of the bump. And again, secondary electrons will be generated. But all secondary electrons, or most of the secondary electrons generated here, they can reach the detector. That's why in, in the second pixel, in the pixel we're drawing now, we have more signals captured. And it will appear bright. When we have dark pixels and the bright pixels, we have contrast. And that's how secondary electrons in conjunction with the, uh, the, uh, the secondary electron detector helps us to create the tomographic information of materials. That's why we can see the, uh, the fracture surface. We can see the nanoparticles or microparticles. We can see powders using SE detector, using secondary electrons in SEM. Does this make sense? Any questions? If I have no questions from you, let me ask you a question. Um, in the lab demo, uh, I mentioned, and also you've seen that, uh, we demonstrated when you have a super large working distance, it seems um, the, uh, the signal intensity is much lower compared to when you have a small working distance. Why? Any guesses? Why, when the working distance is large, the secondary electron, um, actually, let me, that's correct, These yes, that's have correct. To travel mm -hmm. more distance. Exactly, exactly. Um, the voltage applied on the, uh, the, the mesh on the grid is constant. So when you have the um, secondary electrons generated far away from the, uh, the detector, then less electrons will travel to, to the detector. We bring that closer to the secondary electron detector, you see better signal. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, let's move on to look deeper into secondary electrons. So the fourth thing is, let's look at what may affect or what could affect the yield of secondary electrons. What could affect the yield of SE? Ideally, we want um, better signal to, signal to noise ratio. That's why usually we want to have more SE generated. But uh, if we have too many SEs generated, the detector may get saturated, then we don't get contrast. There's always a sweet spot. But what knobs we can tune, or what properties 
we can um, we can have in the materials to affect to control the uh, the yield or to to influence the yield of secondary electrons. There are two things we can look at the energy of the beam. More specifically, it's the voltage and the current. And the material, the Z, atomic number of the material. If we plot the relationship, looking at the very first one, if we plot the relationship of the energy of the beam, E beam, and the yield that's called eta, let's say yield, it follows a very nice relationship. It's not monotonic. Initially, it goes up, but after a while, it tails down. So initially, especially for voltage, initially, if you increase the voltage, you get more yield, more secondary electrons are getting created, are getting generated. But as you increase the voltage further, you do not see an increase, rather you see a decrease of the secondary electron yield. The really sweet window we have here is one to 10. KeV. Initially, as you increase the, uh, the, the voltage, you get more secondary electrons generated. It makes sense. It's not surprising. Why? When you further increase the energy of the electrons, you see a decrease of the um, secondary electrons. Any guesses? More collisions of electrons? Uh, more collisions should lead to more secondary electrons. Uh, is that correct? <laughs> um, we, we mentioned previously, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the, the, the way, the, 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 the logic you have is correct. Um, let, let me give you a hint. Um, on the previous page, we said, if the secondary electrons are generated deep down in the specimen, they cannot travel to the surface. They will be absorbed by the material. So we increase the voltage of the beam, then it will interact with the deeper part of the material. It will penetrate further, the interact with the material. So the secondary electrons generated deep down cannot escape. So that's why you have a decreasing yield. You, you, you are, uh, I don't know who answered the other the question, but you're right. Um, you said there's more collisions, and, but to be more specifically, you're, you're exactly right. To be more uh, specifically, it's because secondary electrons are generated more deep down in the material, and more secondary electrons are getting absorbed before they can escape from the surface to be detected. Too bad, like I cannot give you like a like a chocolate. Hopefully. Uh, um, when we get together for the final exam, uh, if there are people showing up in person for the final exam, uh, I'll bring some more chocolates. Okay, very good, very good. So now let's look at the effect of the atomic number. We also call this is uh, Z. Okay. Again, let's draw the uh, relationship on the x-axis, that's the atomic number. On the y-axis, that's yield. Let's just use eta. Um, for secondary electrons, what people observed is you get a flat line. So secondary electron is not, the yield of secondary electrons is not affected by the z of the material. So if you have, if you have two phases in your material, if you're looking at uh, um, aluminum alloys, especially aluminum copper alloys, um, and you age, you, you heat treat the specimen to grow precipitates. You have 
copper rich precipitates. Copper has higher Z than aluminum. If you use pure secondary electrons, you cannot see any contrast. You cannot see any contrast. Okay, any comments, any questions before we move on to something um, polymer and the bio people are very interested in? Uh, excuse me, what was the reason that copper precipitates are hard to be seen? Oh, uh, I said copper precipitates will not be seen. Um, when we discuss the uh, backscattered electrons, then copper pre precipitates will be seen. Uh, I'm telling you like here, um, Z, the atomic number, will not affect the yield of secondary electrons. But later, when we talk about the, um, the, uh, the backscattered elect uh, electrons, you will see a huge difference. Okay, thanks. Okay, no worries. Um, so if you have copper aluminum, um, like, you know, two-phase material, you will not see any differences if you only use secondary electrons to form images. So secondary electrons is not the right tool to do chemical analysis. It gives you the surface information, but not chemical information. Theoretically, theoretically. Okay, the next we'll see um, the charging issue. What causes charging and how to mitigate, uh, how to mitigate it? Non-conductive samples. Very good, very good. Um, but first of all, let's take a small step back, looking at what causes charging. Remember we, we said the primary electrons, so let's use green, so primary electrons, those are, very, uh, are of very high energy. And the secondary electrons, they're of low energy. What this tells us is one primary electron could eject multiple secondary electrons or could, could, could kick out multiple secondary electrons. If you think, of, um, if you think about like the, the, the bowling, the game, you have the, 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 the bowling ball in your hand, it's very heavy. You have pins on the other end, then you throw out the ball, it hits, it hits the pins. It's not like one ball, one pin. In most of the cases, you hit one, like you, you throw one ball, like all nine pins can, go, can be gone because the, the, the energy of the ball you throw out, that's the primary electron, is much, much higher than the energy of the secondary electrons. Those are the pins flying out when you hit them. What happens to the material is it creates an electrical imbalance. I'm putting in one electron, I'm kicking out multiple electrons, then the sample will be positively charged. If you work with a metal or semiconductor, the metal and the semiconductor can readily absorb electrons from the ground, from the surrounding. So it's not a problem at all. However, if you work, if you work with non-conductive materials like polymers or diamond, like non-conductive um, ceramics, you put in one electron, the multiple electrons come, uh, they, they come out, the sample will be positively charged. If the sample is positively charged, it will repel the electrons 
coming from the from the from the electron source, then you have the charging issue. And this is the fundamental reason why you have charging on non-conductive materials. There are multiple ways to mitigate charging. One way, which has been mentioned already, so strategies. to mitigate charging. One way is to do coating. This is also um, the, the easiest and best developed way. The second way, the second way actually is to lower your voltage. That's a more electron microscopist way to do it. Lower E or voltage. As we mentioned before, the charging of the non-conductive material is when you inject one electron, multiple electrons, they come out. If we reduce, if we reduce the SE over Sorry, let me, yeah, let, let's write that down. So let's, if we reduce the, uh, the ratio, the SE versus the primary electron, let's just call PE, the ratio to about one, then there's no charging. What you do is you inject one electron and create or kick out one electron. So one primary electron in, one secondary electron out. It is possible. It is possible. What you can do is you use some very low voltages. Um, for example, I looked at some silica before. If we reduce the voltage to 0.3 keV, even without coating. I was able to generate reasonably nice images. The exact voltage you use is material dependent. Um, for some of the materials, one kV is good enough. For some of the materials, you probably have to further reduce the voltage to 0.1 kV to achieve the one in, one out kind of relationship. Before we wrap up today's class, let me ask you, what's the problem? What's, what's the, uh, the sacrifice we have to make when we reduce the, uh, the, uh, the voltage of the electron beam, the primary beam? Less secondary electron. Very good, very good, very good. So a challenge associated with lower the voltage to something very low, like 0.3 keV, 0.1 keV, is low yield of secondary electrons. If we have low yield, then we have low signal to noise ratio. Again, in electron microscopy, if we want to improve one thing, in most of the cases, we have to sacrifice another. For um, metal coating, um, not necessarily like metal, it can be amorphous carbon as well. So metal and carbon. It's not flawless. It also creates problems. If you have super, super, super thin nanofibers, if you have super, super, super small um, nanoparticles, the coating will change your morphology. That's the problem. What's the thinnest coating they can do? Um, can you repeat your question again, please? What's the uh, thinnest coating that they can do? The thinnest coating. That's very good. That's, that, that's a very good question. Um, conventional coating usually is about five nanometers. That's the, 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 the conventional, what the conventional coaters can do. Nowadays, with very good coaters, you can achieve one to two nanometers. But if you have five nanometer particles you want to look at and your coating is one to two nanometers, 
it's already over 20% of the features are your coding. And what you see will not represent what they actually are. Another thing is when you do coding, in most of the cases, it's not continuous. It forms super, super fine islands. If you are interested in looking at the, the surface, when you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in to very high magnification, it's kind of like the, the dried land kind of texture. That also may ruin what you, what you try to reveal in SEM. So if you're looking at a bulk sample, looking uh, only worrying about uh, features, maybe hundreds of nanometers in size, coating is the way to go. If you're looking at something very, very small, then probably using a lower voltage, that's the way to go. Towards the end of the class, we'll introduce another technique called helium ion microscopy. That's another way to mitigate the charging issues. We'll discuss that more in details in the very last class. Any questions on secondary electrons before we start the lab session? I know we are running slightly over time. Yeah, I have a quick question about the, um, so you said when um, the material is charged, it starts to repel the electron, um, but wouldn't it be electron deficient? I mean, I'm just trying to. It, it is electron deficient. That's why it's positively charged. And then so it would not absorb the incoming electrons, it would just repel it? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. It's positively, it's positively charged. Then in theory, it should, it should attract the, uh, the, the electrons. Let me think about it. Uh, if it's positively charged, it creates an electric field. Uh, I, 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 I see the point now. Um, then locally, it, it generates electric field, which distorts your beam. What you try to do in SEM is to create something really, really fine, like a probe, really, really, really fine probe. And uh, um, when the electron beam hits like a very small area of material, will generate signals. When you have like electric field coming from the specimen, it will distort your beam. And that causes charging. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I was just thinking about electron in and out or just yeah. the balance of the overall material. Okay, yeah. that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Any other questions about secondary electrons? Um, in today's lab, uh, I know we haven't discussed the, uh, the uh, backscattered electron imaging mode. Uh, regardless, I'll show you what we can see before going through the, uh, the, the, the physics. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Do we see uh, electrical imbalance in metals? Do we see electrical? Uh, yeah. Do uh, we see charging? Um, we, we do not see charging in metal in the way that uh, if your metal is not insulated from your stage, from your stuff, then the charge imbalance can be balanced out by electrons from ground. Um, the instrument oh, okay. is grounded. Your sample is always grounded. Oh, okay. So if it's conductive, then although you are creating local um, like electron deficiency, but the free, freely moving electrons, they will just like they will, they will, they will come in and uh, fill in the, uh, the holes to make the, uh, the sample neutral again. So for metals and the semiconductors, you don't have the other uh, problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, no worries. However, if you have a metal, then you coat the back of the metal with wax, you put it in SEM, or you put a super glue at the back of the metal, then it will charge. Because like it, it blocks the other grounding. Okay, very good questions. Any other questions before we go to do the lab? <laughs> 